Thank you, worship team. Thank you. Um, it's nice to be in the light. Again, I can see you and you can see me a little better. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, we continue to make progress and Lucas and a number of uh, Kent and I'm going to miss people, I know. Uh, we're working with Randy uh, this week and getting the sound working where we need it and lights and it's kind of cool actually. You, I don't know if you picked up on it. Um, Everything's in scenes, like uh, the older lights uh, are now um, LEDs, and I shared with you, like, at this point, we can run all the white globes for the price of just one six months ago. So, huge energy savings, but they're all tied together, so the spots, the house lights, whatever this cool stuff is behind me, uh, it all works together through scenes. So um, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of like my aquarium at home. I'm having fun with this. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep experimenting, but that doesn't just happen. That takes a lot of work and a lot of labor and patience. And uh, thank you for all you who have worked so hard helping to make that happen. Also, as we start, oh, they took them. I was going to change out. We'll, just, we'll sway with it. It'll be the move of the Spirit, all right? We can do this. But uh, thank you for those. Kids have already made it to Children's Church. Uh, Greg, if you would be sure, we're going to take up a uh, benevolence offering at the end. Just make sure the guys are ready for that. And so why don't we pray, and uh, we'll look into God's Word together. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are a great and awesome and wonderful God. That you are the creator of the universe as far as we can see and beyond. I was impressed by the phrase that you hold time in your hand. In you, there is really no past, no future. Time, you're beyond time. And in all of your majesty and all of your glory, you created us. You gave us life. And Father, even when we rebelled against you, you still loved us with a never-ending, unconditional, fierce love. And Lord, you demonstrated that as we saw just these past couple of weeks by the sending of your Son, Jesus Christ, to die. That our unrighteousness might be placed upon him as he died on the cross. And that the very righteousness of Christ might be credited to us for the purpose that we could be drawn back into intimate relationship with you. Lord, we get busy. We get busy with our families. We get busy with our jobs. But Lord, through your Holy Spirit, remind us throughout the busyness of life as Brady was saying, of your incredible, unending love for us, for me. May we rest in that. May we find joy and contentment in that place. And Father, as we open your word this morning, again, I ask that you would speak to us. May your Holy Spirit speak to each one what we need to hear. For I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's hard to believe, but it was 2007, it'll be going on 10 years here in just about a month, that our family uh, packed up for a bit of an adventure and moved to Minnesota. Now, at that time, the kids were a lot younger. That's kind of hard to believe as well, looking back. And so we had sold our home. And just like you guys, many of you have done, if you've moved, or especially if you've moved cross-country, uh, it, it's a chore. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a job. And we'd spent about two days loading two trucks with all kinds of, I had no idea we had so much stuff, uh, but when you start having children, you realize you have a lot of stuff. And it was hot. It was hot. It was mu If you've ever been in the South, you know what I mean. It was one of those days where you t change your t-shirt about four times because you literally sweat through it. Uh, we had packed the trucks. We cleaned the house. We had, yeah, pastors do this too. We had deal dealt with a, kind of a jerk of a realtor from the other side who was really trying to pull something at the end. Our realtor said, just go, I'll deal with it. 
And so it was around three in the afternoon and it was hot and we were tired and we got in, Marlene drove one truck, she can drive a truck. Um, I drove the other truck and Jennifer and Andrew, I don't remember where Ashley and Katie ended up in the mix, but anyway, Jennifer, and Andrew, Jennifer was driving the van. We called the van the Ark because along with Jennifer and Andrew were the dog, two rabbits, Probably a cat, maybe a couple hamsters. I don't remember, but it was kind of the arc, and it was, it was following along. And our, our goal that day, we knew we were tired, we knew we were exhausted. We just wanted to get about 200 miles behind us, get up on the interstate, kind of come up through the Ozarks, find our way on the interstate, and, and get that much made on the trip. We still knew we had two days ahead of us. And so we made our way up through the Ozarks, and that went well, and that's kind of an adventure in and of itself. David knows that trip. He's been down that road a few times, and it's beautiful, but it's a, a, lot, of, a lot of curves through there. And we got up onto 40, and we were just getting up to speed, and it's kind of like we were beginning to breathe a little bit. No air in the truck, so we're still sweating. And all of a sudden, the phone rings, and it's Jennifer, and she's hyperventilating. I can't drive! I can't drive! I can't drive! And it's like, what? You can't drive? It won't it won't steer, it won't steer, it won't steer. It's stopping, everything's stopping. I'm like, well, okay, okay, pull over, pull over way off on the median. We'll pull over and take a look at it. So we do that. Now, now get the picture. Two 18-foot Penske trucks, a van, a dog, rabbits, cats, four kids, two tired parents, 90 plus degrees and a humidity of 200%, okay, and cars whizzing by. We go back, and sure enough, I figured it, it's probably the alternator. The van wasn't going anywhere. It, it, was, it was dying fast. I'm like, great. That's all we needed. So we, I called AAA, did have AAA, and it's Friday afternoon to make it worse. I mean, I, the worst case scenario is going through my mind. Five o'clock, Friday afternoon, broken down on Interstate 40. Okay. So he comes, and he says, well, where do you want me to take it? I said, but... I have no clue. You, you tell me where we need to take it. He says, well, we could take it to Fort Smith. There's a dealer there, and he could repair it, but they're closed till Monday. And I'm like, no big news there. And he says, tell you what, I've got a friend two exits up that runs a garage. Let me give him a call. I said, that'd be awesome. You call him. So he comes back. He says, they're still there. They're still there. Well, why don't we go there? I said, that'll be fine. Just whatever. Let's get all 40. So we followed him, and he towed the van, and we head back into, I don't even remember the little town at this point, and we pull up to this garage, and seriously, guys, any other time, you couldn't have paid me to go in this place. It looked that rough. I get out, and I go and talk to them, and he goes, yeah, well, I guess we can fix that. Um, let, me, I'll, let me take a look at it. And I'm thinking, okay, it's five o'clock on Friday afternoon in Arkansas, and it's hot. Any mechanic would be on the Arkansas River fishing and putting down a six-pack by now. What, what do you mean? You know, so we, we're, we're here, and, and he looks at it, he comes back to the alternator. And I go, yeah, I kind of figured that. How much is this going to cost? And um, he sa I said, well, can you fix it? Well, it depends if I can get the part. And I'm like, okay, see if you can get the part. So he comes back. He says, I got, I got somebody going over to get the part. And I'm like, well, this is pretty awesome, Friday afternoon. And um, he comes back, and it gets there, and, he, and it gets there rather quickly. And I said, well, can we put it on? Now, I mean, put yourself in the mechanic's place for a moment. You got this guy. I mean, his whole, all of his belongings are in truck out front. It's Friday afternoon. He's got four kids. He's between homes. I can do with this guy whatever I want. And, you know, it's like he's my puppet. And he says, I'll, I, I can do this. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of this. Why don't you go over there? There's, it's a good little restaurant, and it did look inhabitable. And, um, <laughs> and why don't you go have dinner, and we'll get things fixed up. I said, okay. So we went over, and there was air conditioning. It was so awesome. There's air conditioning in the restaurant. And so we ate. The kids were hungry, and they were tired. And so we ate and um, came back over. It was about an hour later. He goes, good to go. I was like, I've read those passages about visiting angels. This is incredible. You know, it's 8 o'clock Friday night, and he's just fixed our alternator. And so um, I went over, and I said, well, how much, <laughs> how much, <laughs> how much, how much do I owe you? <laughs> I'd replaced a few uh, alternators before, and I knew kind of what they would cost, but I'm like, this guy can charge me $1,200, and I'm going to have to pay it. I mean, there's no choice. 300 bucks. I kind of looked, I said, 300 He said, yep, that's all. Okay, so I'm writing the check real quick as this rat's running across the back of the wall, you know. That's the kind of, I'm not kidding, this huge rat, because the kids were with me, and they would get back in the truck, and they're, did you see that rat? <laughs> I was blown away. 
Friday afternoon, late, 8.30, the time we got done, 8.30 or 9, hot, and this guy and his mechanics stayed, put an alternator into a car of someone he did not know who would never come back and give him business again, and then charged us a, a giveaway caught charge for the repair. It was incredible. You don't find that kind of service in the world too often. We got here, I actually wrote him a letter and just thanked him. Just thanked him for his kindness and helping us. And as we turn to our passage this morning, there is a call and there is a gift. There is a gift and a call upon each one of us to serve to serve one another in that same kind of way. To go above and beyond. Not just the bare minimum to get by. Above and beyond. A gifting and a call to serve. So turn, if you will, in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. We've been working through Romans We've been working our way through Romans. Uh, you'll remember our basic outline, Romans 12. Um, it's where we're going to be this morning. But our basic outline in Romans 1 through 3, the chapters, if you read through there, if you go back and read, I encourage you to do that just to keep Romans fresh. An incredible book. Woman through, 1 through 3 is the diagnosis that you and I are dead in our sin. We are separated from God. We are spiritually bankrupt. There is nothing that we can offer God. There is nothing we have to offer to God. Um, we are spiritually dead, just like a corpse. And that is our condition. If anything's going to happen, if any life is going to be found, it's going to have to come from the outside in because we have nothing to offer. Then we looked at chapters 3 through 11, that beautiful thesis on the deliverance that is ours through Jesus Christ. He is the one who stepped into our world. He is the one who brought righteousness to us. He is the one who opened our relationship to God. He is the one who gives us all those incredible gifts that we looked at of, a, of adoption and righteousness. It's all because of Jesus Christ. It's all because of Him. Not at all because of ourselves. And then we get to chapter 12 and it becomes a demonstration a demonstration of what does this life in Christ look like? And it's a good question because we're all scratching our head. What does that mean? Like Brady was saying, does it mean I have to really try hard to be good? Because if that's it, there's a problem because I can't. It doesn't work. I'm not, I don't have the ability in and of myself to do that. And we begin to realize, no, it's the presence and the power of Christ alive within us that gives us the ability, the power to say no to sin and yes to Christ. It's that new heart that we've been given that's a spiritually alive to God and wants to please Him. We still struggle with the flesh. We looked at that. But we also have forgiveness. We can rest in that too. And so he begins to flesh out in a very practical way, what does this new life in Christ look like for you and me on a Monday morning? And that's where we are. We're starting here with verse 12. We covered this a couple weeks ago before Easter, and as I was praying and thinking through it, I, I just wanted to pause. I wanted to spend one more week on it because I wanted, I wanted it to be that real. So we're going to look at this idea of spiritual gifts again rather quickly for the topic. There's a lot that could be said. And then I want to cover some very specific, practical ideas. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. So look at Romans chapter 12, and I'll read it for us, beginning with verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. But to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individual members one to another. 
having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads, lead with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy in cheerfulness. Spiritual gifts, what are they? What are they not? Spiritual gifts, this is a definition. If you went through the network series, we did it a few years ago. We probably could do it again here before too long. Spiritual gifts are special abilities. Special abilities given by the Holy Spirit, given by God, distributed to every believer according to God's design and grace for the common good of the body of Christ. We're going to look some verses, and you're going to see those themes, those truths come through. Spiritual gifts, it's not something I, I, I make happen myself. It is the power and presence of Christ alive within me, and He gives to me special, certain gifts and abilities. And we're going to look at those. One gift's not better than the others. Some gifts are more visible than others, but it doesn't mean one's better than the other. And if you're a believer here this morning, you have placed your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ, you have at least one spiritual gift. And God gives those gifts for the purpose of, sir, of, of the functioning of the church so that we function well, that we carry out the mission, the purpose that he's given to us of taking the gospel to the world. What they're not, because this is important too, Spiritual gifts are not natural talents, okay? It's, uh, we just had a big crew up here for worship team, and they have a gift for music, some vocal, some instruments. Those aren't necessarily spiritual gifts. Those are natural abilities, natural talents. But they can be used as they're exercising spiritual gifts. Maybe you have the spiritual gift of encouragement and you use your natural talent for music to encourage others. Okay, you see what I'm talking about? There is a difference. And we'll look at what some of the actual spiritual gifts are here in a moment. It's not the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, in Galatians 5, you have the listing of the fruit of the Spirit and those are characteristics, those are traits. Love, joy, kindness, patience, goodness. Those are traits of, of the presence of Christ alive within us. And as we yield to his presence, he is able to express himself through us. So that when people see us, they may see a patience that's different from the world. Because it comes from Christ. And we all have those fruit of the Spirit within us. Because Christ lives within us. And to the extent we yield ourselves to his purpose and his presence and his power in our lives, they become more and more obvious. That's part of the growing in Christ process. But those traits, those are not spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are not a position or an office. I serve here in the role of pastor. Some of you serve in the role of elders or church board team ministry leaders. And while you may use your spiritual gifts in that office or that position, the position itself is not the spiritual gift, okay? So that's what our spiritual gifts are not. Let's look at some verses. There's four basic passages that you want to be aware of when you're looking at spiritual gifts, all right? So I'm just going to kind of read through these, and we'll highlight some of the, 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 the larger areas. And in most of these passages, I'm just taking a section because we don't have time this morning to go through all. There's more said in each of these passages on spiritual gifts, but this is kind of the heart of each passage. So the Romans 12, we just read it. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, you and I, the church, though we are many, we are one body in Christ. All right? 
and individually members one to another, having gifts that differ according to the grace God has given to us. Let us use them. And then he goes into that portion listing some of the gifts, and we use them in proportion to the faith or the gift that's given to us. All right, so we see these gifts are given by God. We don't make them happen ourselves. 1 Corinthians 12. Now you are the body of Christ. He's using the same metaphor here, a physical body. You are the body of Christ. And individually members of it. It sounds exactly like he said in Romans. And God has appointed... In the church, first apostles, and then second prophets, third teachers, the miracles and the gifts of healing, helping, administration, and various kinds of tongues, okay? So again, we, we see some of the same gifts. We see some different gifts listed here. But the important thing, we're part of a body. We all have gifts. We all have abilities. And we need to be using them. Two shorter passages, Ephesians 4. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. So here we we begin to address the issue of purpose. Why did he give us these gifts? So that we can use them and go, look how good I am at this. Isn't this awesome? Give me a hand. No, it, 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 it's, it's not about you. It's not about me. God gives us these gifts to serve others. And back to my illustration, it, it's not the bare minimum to get by. It is a joyous serving that I want to do this. And I want it to be over and beyond. Because that's the kind of God we serve, folks. He's not a, let's just get by, bare minimum kind of God. 1 Peter 4, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. The gift is a gift of God's grace to you. And he's saying, use it. Use it in serving one another. I mean, imagine, imagine you're a chemist, and you're in your lab, and by some fluke of a chance, you, you discover, as you're working with genomes and DNA, you discover the, the problem, the, the issue of Parkinson's disease. And with just a few manipulations, not only can you prevent it, you can cure it. Are you going to sit on that? That's a pretty awesome discovery. I might write about it in a year or two. No. You're going to push that out in the scientific community for others to research and to see if they can reduplicate it, to see if it's really true. You're going to push that forward as fast as you can because there are people dying every day with Parkinson's. And God has given you the, the freedom and the ability to discover a cure. And that's the way spiritual gifts are. He's given us a gift. Are we just going to sit on it? Eh, yeah, whatever. Are we going to deploy that gift and use that gift in serving each other and the community in which we live and which we're called? So those are our four key verses. Now, what are some takeaways from those verses? I'll stay on this side. You guys can't see through me. Now you have to work through this, okay? Spiritual gift takeaways. What are some things from those passages that we have? First of all, they're divine endowments. They're gifts. We've covered that. They're they're from God to you. You have at least one gift, every believer here. They're distributed by God's design. I don't pray for you and bestow a gift upon you. Uh, You don't necessarily pray and, and, and make yourself a teacher. God gives the gifts, according to his purposes. 
But I think it's even more specific. He gives gifts to believers in specific local churches for what he wants to do through that church body. Have you ever thought about it? God has a purpose a desire, a design, and he wants to use you and I as part of the local church body here at Swan Lake to fulfill that purpose. He wants us to do something. He has a purpose for us. He has gifted, it, gifted us for it. He has called us towards it. They're distributed by God. Spiritual gifts are to be used within the church interdependently. And we talked about this at length a couple weeks ago. That your, 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 your body life, your life with each other is not to be a dependent life. Now there are always times that in our own lives where maybe we are dependent. But there's not a lot we can bring to the table. Maybe we're sick. Maybe we're taking care of someone in our family. And we don't have maybe the time, the energy, the finances, or whatever to bring a whole lot to the table. And we're really dependent upon the body of Christ coming around and encouraging and serving me. That's part of the reason the church exists, folks. And that's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is the person or persons who... who Look at the church for what they can get out of it. Not just for a season, but for years. I mean, for years they'll come and they'll, they'll sit here and, and, and they'll, it's, it's all, what's here for me? Are they going to sing my song this morning? Is the pastor going to be good enough to hold my attention this morning? And it's all about what I get out of the service what I get out of what's going on. And they'll go on that way for years. And it's interesting, I've been in ministry long enough to know that many times those people, they're the very ones that, that, that at the time, maybe, maybe, maybe they are called upon to do something. They're out. Because there's no connection. There's no interconnection with the body of Christ. So we're not to be dependent Neither are we to be independent. We're not to simply come and act like, I don't need you. I'm here. I'm doing my thing. I really don't need your participation. I don't need your help. I got this covered. I've got, matter of fact, I'm better at it than you are. So just, no. That's not what we're looking at either. What we're looking at is interdependency, the idea of a body. And some of us are heads and you get seen a lot. Some of us are toes. And like I like to tell people, you don't think toes are important? Slam your middle toe into a bedpost tonight and watch how you wobble and hobble for the rest of the week. Toes are important, guys. You need them for balance. You need them to walk. And sometimes we forget that until one's hurting and not useful for us. We are interdependent on each other in the same way. All right? Spiritual gifts are designed to equip and serve the church. Part of the purpose of gifts is to equip one another for the purpose God has for us. I don't stand up here each week just to blow hot air. At least that's not my purpose, okay? Hopefully you don't think that way. My goal is to help us to understand the truths of Scripture, to apply them to our lives in a way that I'm equipping you for service that I'm helping you to grow in your faith in such a way that you can walk from this place and God can use you this coming week. And no matter what your spiritual gift, maybe it's the gift of encouragement, and you come on a Sunday morning and you're looking for people simply to encourage. And folks, there's a lot of people that need encouragement. We need each other. We need to be able to put our hand on the shoulder of a brother, sister in Christ and say, let's sit down here and let's pray about that. Well, you've got that surgery Thursday. You can count on me. I will be praying at 1 o'clock Thursday for that surgery. And then calling them up and following up and letting them know, I was praying, how are you doing? Interdependency. Then finally, spiritual gifts are to be deployed. They're to be used. They're to be used. It's just like that Parkinson's cure. 
It's not meant to sit on, to be stored up in a lab for 20 years. You get it out there as fast as you can. And maybe it's not even perfected yet, but man, it it moves the research way down the road and others can grab hold of that research and add to it and and begin to make it better. Deploy it. Deploy it. We have been gifted and called in service to one another. That's spiritual gifts. Now, you say, well, what are they? Um... It's hard, honestly. You go back to our four passages, it's hard to come up with a comprehensive list. But, but here's some that begin to come forth. And, and some have even said, maybe, maybe the writers of Scripture, they're writing in a, a, a far and more of an Eastern mindset. You and I, we like lists. We like to be able to balance the list. We like to connect the dots. They think a little differently. This may possibly not even be all the gifts, But these are the ones we're aware of. And I kind of grouped them. There's discernment and faith and intercession and knowledge. Uh, We won't go into defining all of them right now, but uh, some of you have the gift of discernment. You're able to walk into a room. You're able to listen to a teacher like myself. You're able to hear something on the radio, and you're like, that's not truth. And we need people with discernment. People can determine when something is just wrong. I'll pick on her. Marlene has the gift of discernment. She can pick up on spiritual issues quickly. When something's just not right. The gift of faith, that's one of Marlene's strong ones as well. Simply the ability to believe when the rest of us are faltering. I falter quickly. I start looking at the the circumstances. I start looking at the world, and I begin to worry, and I get get out of shape. Marlene's like, Ray, God's got this. If he wants you to spend $1,200 on a new alternator, it's his money anyway, then that's what we'll spend it on. And I'm like, yeah, but. No, no, no buts. God's got this. He's going to take care of us. You're right. You're right. You preach Sunday. Okay. Then there's this next category, the gift of encouragement, the gift of giving. Have you ever met some people like that? And again, not so much the amount, but they just have a gift to give. And nothing makes them happier than to place maybe some funds in an envelope and stick it in a box out there because they know you're going through a tough time and their name's not even attached to it. They don't want their name attached to it. They don't want the limelight. They they don't want anything in return. They just find incredible joy out of giving. And they give relentlessly. Some of the coolest people that you'll meet. The gifts of helps and hospitality and mercy are spiritual gifts. Some of you just have the ability to, to welcome people into your homes or into a church home and to make them feel comfortable and welcomed the gift of hospitality. Some of you think, I can't do that. I would choke. I wouldn't know what to say. Okay, it's not your gift. Don't worry about it. It's their gift. Evangelism, leadership, teachers, kind of a different category there. Some of those you see a little bit more, maybe week to week, but, but not any more important than any of the other gifts. And then our what I would call some of the more miraculous gifts. And there's a discussion. Are these, are these available to the church today? Or did God just simply use those when the church was young to authenticate the message? My thought is, God can use any gift, any place he chooses. I'm not going to tell him, no, he can't do those anymore. And especially stories I hear coming from overseas, God is using those very kinds of miraculous types of gifts of healing and tongues and interpretation and miracles and prophecy. He's using those gifts again to authenticate a message in a culture that is so darkened. And so, yeah, miraculous, certainly. And as we look at the New Testament, to authenticate a message. Are they still around today? I'm going to let God make that call, okay? But those are part of the gifts as well. Difficulties in deploying these gifts. One thing is you're just unsure. I don't even know what my gift is. What are you talking about, Ray? 
I'm not even sure what you're talking about. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know where to start. I got you covered, okay? On your way out, on the kiosk, are going to be a stack of yellow sheets. And it's a spiritual gift survey. You just answer some questions. Add up the totals, and it will begin to show you where you might have a higher gift skill in those areas. That's a place to start. It's not the gospel, it's not inspired, but it's a place to start. And if you take that and you realize, hey, I've got, it says I've got the gift of teaching. I've never taught anything. I don't even like standing up in front of people. Okay. We'll talk about that. Maybe we can design a, a, a smaller setting that's no overwhelming. I'm not going to put you up here preaching next Sunday, okay? We won't do that to you. But we might find a couple among us that with some time and with some training and with some, some, some practice, you realize, you know, I never thought of myself as a teacher, but I have a pretty good handle of Scripture, and I enjoy this, and I feel God using me when I do it, and, and I never thought I would, but I do. So that's the purpose in the survey, and that's out there. And then following the service next week, you take it home, you take the survey. Following the service next week, I'll meet with you back over here. And you just show up, bring your survey, and we'll talk through it and what it means and how you might take the next step in the idea of using and deploying spiritual gifts, okay? So one thing, I find a lot of people just unsure. I'm not sure what this means. So we got a plan. Some, it's fear. I can't. I just can't. I don't speak clearly. When I start talking to people, my tongue gets tied. I say stupid things. I, 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 I. We all have things we fear. But the beautiful things about spiritual gifts is as you begin to use them, as you begin to develop them, there is a, there is a confidence and peace because it's really not about you. It's about Christ working through you. And you'll find working in this area of giftedness is something you enjoy. And you can work for hours in this area. It doesn't grow tiring. It gives you life. It gives you energy. It's not a drag. Other people say, hey, did you know, I just want to say, you are so encouraging. Or man, do you realize how many people you help? Do you know how much you're appreciated in this church family because you help so many people? I mean, you don't say anything about it, but I'm out talking to people, and I just hear what you've done, and that's pretty awesome. So other people affirm these gifts in us as well. Don't let fear stop you. Too distracted, too busy. We all have to fight that. I can't serve, I can't give, because I'm just too busy. And I guess my response as a pastor, because we are spiritual beings who belong to God, God has a purpose for us. If you're so busy, you can't fulfill God's purpose for you, you're too busy. You're probably not going to fix that this week, but you can begin to look at your plate and decide, what here do I need to offload? What here do I need to let go of? So that I can begin to be used the way God has gifted and designed me. I mean, it could be something as, 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 as hands-on as debt. How am I going to get out of debt over the next three years so I can quit my second job and third job so that I can give myself more to what God has designed me for? It can be that practical. But we get so busy, we get so entangled with the world that the spiritual just gets put on the shelf. And yet that's what we are designed for. That's where we're going to find life and enjoyment and happiness. That's what we're doing and being what God has designed us for. And yet many times it's the first thing we stick on the shelf. Number four, let's let someone else do it. You know, it's a church. They got elders. They got a board. They got it covered. I'm going to have some fun with you now, okay? You can sit here. I'm going to travel. We tried this earlier. This is supposed to work. Let me catch up to myself. Okay. You just sit here. We're going to talk, but I'm going to be back here, all right? Yep, we got a... Hi, Dave. Good to see you. Welcome back. Okay. I'm back here in the foyer. Yep, we've got a board. 
We've got people in charge in places of ministry for things like ushers and greeters. Probably a greeter shook your hand this morning. How about Awana? Wednesday night. Or VBS, we have VBS coming up soon, and it'll be set up like this, and the kids will be sitting where you are, and we'll be, Aaron and some of them will be leading worship up front, and what you'll notice is in the back, whether it's Wednesday night uh, as we're closing Awana, or it's VBS, this whole area back here in the foyer fills up with moms and dads, because they're curious, they want to see what's going on, and we encourage them to come in. Guest. What if you took it upon yourself? Lord, I'm going to be the one who serves those parents. And I'm going to come, and my purpose is to make those parents on Wednesday night feel appreciated, thank them for bringing their kids, that they feel welcomed. As VBS shuts down, I'm going to be the one in the back that's just working his way through the parents and talking to them and appreciating them and loving on them and helping them feel appreciated. Yeah, there's greeters and they're, they're doing the official, but I, this is just what I feel called to do. I want to encourage these families this way. And that's what I'm going to do. You came in. And you notice the back row was pretty well blocked off and reserved. And I did that because I won't embarrass you, okay? I was talking to the elders. A ministry to the back row. Who sits on the back row besides Greg? Who sits on the back row? Who do you think? Tell me. Those with kids sometimes, yep. But who else? New people. Because they come through the door at 9.30 because they don't want to have to talk to anyone necessarily. And they slide in on the back row and they want to have a quick exit when they leave. Don't laugh. You've done it yourself when you visit churches. You sit at the back. New people sit on the back row. Who else sits in the back row? Who? Late. Oh, they come late. And a lot of times they come late because they're trying to hide a little bit. People that are hurting. People that are embarrassed, who they look at their life and they feel like, I really don't need to be here. I don't deserve to be here. But I know I need to meet with God, and so I'm here. And you'll see sometimes they're on the back row, and you can just see the hurt in their eyes. What if you used your gift of mercy? And my purpose is to minister to the back row. When I'm here on a Sunday, and it's not an official office, it doesn't come under a board-sanctioned position, but when I'm here, I'm going to minister to the back row. And next week, I've got to take my kid to something for school. I won't be here. That's fine. But the following week when I hear, my focus, my intent is going to be to minister to the back row. I'm not going to overwhelm them. But I'm going to speak to them, I'm going to know their name, and I'm going to make sure they know that I'm glad they're here. A ministry to the back row. What if I go further back here? Let's see who's back here, I'm not sure. Oh, they're sealed, they're, they're locked down hard back here. Having fun back here? Yeah. Good, we're talking about you. It's okay. All right. <laughs> nursery. The spays are in nursery this morning. They're smiling still, and we're about done. That's a good thing. What if your ministry, your calling, your purpose was to stand about right here? And every morning you get here about 15, 20 minutes early and you kind of just stand right here and you greet families with young children as they come through. Some come every week. They're part of Swan Lake. Some are new. They've never been here before. And you talk to them. You let them know that you're glad they're here. If one of their kids has been sick, maybe, and they're better now, maybe you pause and you pray with them and just thank the Lord they're feeling better. 
If a guest comes through the door, you introduce them to the space, you, you bring them in then, and you introduce them to some people in the congregation, you help them feel at home just like they, if they came into your house. No different. Your ministry is to the young families that are coming in with small children, helping them to feel welcomed and appreciated and connected. That's what you do. Back here, Greg Schwartz and I, we try to be sure on Saturday the coffee is set up and ready to go because I like coffee and I need coffee on Sunday morning. And it probably, it's just there. It kind of takes care of itself. But what if you were a person and you just kind of placed yourself at the coffee pot, kind of like the nursery person does? And what I'm going to do on the Sundays I'm here, I'm going to be, my ministry is the coffee pot. And I'm going to engage with people. And again, I'm going to get to know them. And I'm going to encourage them. And if they're struggling, I might pray with them. And if I find out they've got something coming up this week, I might call and check in with them. I may send them a text or an email letting them know I'm praying. I'm looking for visitors and I'm helping them get oriented to this, this house and how they might be a part. Ministry at the coffee pot. How about back here? We've been thinking about this. This is the back door. We have to keep it open because it gets wet back there and kind of sours if you leave the door shut. Half of you come through this door. What if someone just said, you know, my ministry is a ministry to the back door. And I'm going to get to know those people. Those are the ones I'm going to begin to learn their names. And I'm going to hold the door for them, and I'm going to greet them as they come in, and I'm going to get to know them in a way that, that again, I can pray for them, I can connect with them during the week, because that's, that's what God's called me to do and to be. And I can do that. And we're not going to make this huge to where it's laborious. I mean, if you're not here on a Sunday, okay, you're not here. Just jump back in next week and use the gifts God has given to us. If you're a teacher, we'll find some ways. We've got small groups, we've got Bible studies, and we can do it in a small enough setting where you can build some confidence and ability, and you can do that. But spiritual gifts have been given to us. They've been, we've been gifted, and we're called and we can't just assume someone else is going to do it. Ah, oh, the board's got that covered. Folks, the board has the basics covered. They can't do it all. There's so much more we can do and could do. But we have to step up and do it. And sometimes we say, well, yeah, but, you know, I did, five years ago, I served on the board. I'm, I'm, I'm done. No, you're not. There's not a verse in Scripture that says, you reach 50 and you're done. Those are the folks we need even more because you've got some wisdom and understanding and experience under your belt. Yeah, but I, I, I ran the children's ministry for three years, four years ago. Yeah, yeah, you did. And if that's an area that you're gifted with administration to, to handle those kinds of areas, then you need to be doing that. Not just simply pretending someone else is going to do it or that it doesn't exist. We're all a part of the body. We're all intertly dependent upon each other. Every single person is important. God has gifted each one of us. And he has called us for a purpose. And what Paul is telling us here in Romans 12 is does, understand your gift and use it. Use it in serving each other so that the church can be a powerful witness in the community in which we live. Okay? Let's pray, and if the gentleman would go ahead and get ready for the offering, that'd be great. And that's cool. We take the benevolence offering. It's a way for us to, to serve the needs of one another. We serve needs within the church family first. We also reach outside of the church family. And what a joy it is because you guys do give and to be able to be a part of helping people 
um, sometimes just with basic bills that come up or medical bills or something, okay? So let me pray for us, and I'll pray for the offering as well. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the gift of a spiritual gift to each one of us. Thank you that not only are we gifted, but we are called. Lord, you have a purpose for us. You have a purpose. And sometimes we have to acknowledge we're too busy. Sometimes we have to acknowledge we're resting on past laurels and past service. Sometimes we have to acknowledge, okay, I was in a position and I was hurt, or maybe I didn't feel appreciated. And we have to grow through that. We have to let that go and realize that we are gifted. We have purpose and that you want to use us. And when we're in that role, we will be our happiest. We will find the most joy. And Lord, we thank you for that. Thank you for this time that we can take this offering. Thank you for the gifts that are given. Lord, use them to encourage those who are struggling. In Jesus' name, amen.